Well, welcome to this, the most difficult and troublesome of all questions that all people have to face, whether they believe in God or not. The problem of suffering and pain is the hard question that keeps more people from believing in God than anything else I know. And so I'm going to try to speak on it and simply share with you some ways I've found helpful in approaching it. I don't claim to have solutions in that sense. Now we're going to have, I hope, a considerable time for Q&A. And in order to make that productive, I suggest that you listen thinking of questions and you write them down during my talk. And I will collect them in the middle. And then if there are other questions, we can take them from the public. But listening to a seminar, thinking of questions, leaves you with about a hundred times more information than if you listen to it passively without asking any questions. So it's part of the didactical method that I find helpful to employ. This is a complex question. First of all, it has two profoundly different sides to it. A famous book written many years ago about Spain pictured an observer sitting on a balcony watching the pilgrims shuffling and moving on their road to wherever below his balcony. The one was watching, the others were participating. And with this problem, you have the same two issues. Cancer looks very different to the young woman of 30 who's just been told she has six months to live from what it looks like to the professor of oncology who's treating her. There's the side of observation and there's the side of participation, which means that any approach will necessarily have to be very sensitive to which of those two things predominates. Intellectual analysis will be important. Counseling and pastoral sympathy will probably be even more important. And you see that exemplified in the New Testament in the story of Martha and Mary and Jesus at the grave of Lazarus. Martha and he had a discussion not far from the grave about the resurrection at the last day. It was profoundly theological. The Lord did not attempt to argue or discuss with Mary. He found her weeping, and so he wept too. And in those two approaches to those two sisters of profoundly different temperaments, I think we get an insight into the heart of God on this. Answers are important, and the Lord gave them. Sympathy, empathy, counsel, comfort are even more important. And the Lord gave those as well. How does one bring hope in situations that are so devastating and often irreversible? You can mend a broken leg, but not a lost child or wife or husband. And so the questions come, why did he get killed and I was left alive? Where can I find hope? Or is that just sentimental irrationality and there is no hope? So it's important to realize that that story of Mary and Martha in John 11 shows the New Testament is aware of the problem. One of the things that convinces me of the inspiration and authority of Scripture is its awareness and its analysis of the big issues. Because you will recall that the sisters sent an urgent message to Jesus about Lazarus' state. He didn't respond to it immediately, and Lazarus died. And when Jesus finally arrived in Bethany, 
when Mary saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. It was a mild rebuke, but it was a rebuke. And when eventually they moved towards the tomb, and Jesus asked, where have you laid him? And they said, come and see, Lord. And we have that profoundly moving statement. Jesus wept, the shortest verse in the whole Bible. And the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? So there's the question. And what I would point out to you for your own thinking is the backdrop to this story which brought the sisters very near to doubting the love of God is the love of God. Again and again in the early part of the story, it is repeated so that we grasp it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So we've got to read the story against the concept of a God of love, which is precisely, of course, the problem that gets thrown at us. And the questions mount up. Why didn't God make a world that couldn't damage people? Why didn't he make people that couldn't damage people? And so on and so forth. And we'll come to those in a moment. But I want to read two very important passages of Scripture that relate to this, one from the Old Testament and one from the New. The first passage is from the book of Job, and it is chapter 1. Job is a huge book, which is a very profound analysis of this problem. But I simply want to read from Job 1, verse 13, what happened to Job? and his family. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and there came a messenger to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped, and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. And the second <clears throat> is from the New Testament in the Gospel by Luke. And it's Luke chapter 13, verse 1. Now, there were some present at that very time who told him, that is Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, what these passages illustrate, as we'll see, that there are two sources of pain and suffering. Logically distinct. 
although in practice they are sometimes almost impossible to separate. The first is moral evil. That is the suffering and pain inflicted by humans on humans. And then there is what is called natural evil. That is the suffering for which humans are not directly responsible or even indirectly. Earthquakes, tsunamis, and cancer. And so it is important to distinguish between the problem of moral evil and the problem of natural evil. The difficulty with the concept of natural evil is that evil is a moral concept. And so many people prefer, quite rightly I think, to call the second problem the problem of pain. And C.S. Lewis does that. So there is the problem of moral evil, what humans do to one another, and then there's the problem of pain, what the cosmos does in its fracturings. And we shall have to look at both of those. They are well illustrated by two cathedrals. I arrived in New Zealand two days after the earthquake. Christ Church Cathedral, which I got up close to, was a sad reflection of its earlier state. And you could see that something serious had happened to it. I've also been, as many of you may have been, to Coventry Cathedral, which was ruined during the past war. And shattered cathedrals are powerful images. And you know at the time of the Christchurch earthquake that the Christchurch Cathedral was used constantly as an image of that tragedy. And so Coventry Cathedral has been. And those two cathedrals give two conflicting impressions, each of them. They both bear traces of their original design and the beauty and elegance they once possessed. And they bear the scars of a catastrophe. They present a mixed picture of destruction and of elegance. And they remind us that there are unlikely to be simplistic answers to these deep questions. But there's a difference between the two cathedrals, isn't there? Christ Church Cathedral was damaged by an earthquake. Coventry Cathedral was damaged by German bombing, as of course was Dresden Cathedral by Allied bombing. Some people compared the Christ Church tragedy with 9-11 in terms of its proportional effect on the country. But of course the difference there is that 9-11 is moral evil. The Christchurch disaster is the problem of pain. Now, you will notice immediately from these two biblical passages that they mix, each of them, the two sources of suffering. That's the striking thing about them. Because in Job, you will see that some of the disasters were perpetrated by warring tribes. The Sabaeans fell on them with the sword. On the other hand, the final catastrophe was caused by a wind blowing the house down. So you've got moral evil, and you've got natural evil. And in Luke, likewise, Jesus was thinking about a horrific situation where Pilate slaughtered certain Jews who were performing sacrifices at the temple. That's moral evil. But then he immediately moves on to the collapse of a tower, a tall building. That's natural evil. And the very fact that in both of those uh, seminal passages in Scripture, both of the sources of pain and suffering come together seems to me to remind us that you can't really ultimately separate them completely. It's obvious, of course, when you think about it, that the one can lead to another. Greedy exploiters can deforest a section of a nation that turns it into a desert and leads to malnutrition and hunger. And we see that connection. Often it is 
uh, staggered in terms of time that the moral evil occurs a long time before the natural evil, but they are intimately connected. And so we can't completely separate them. Now, how do we react to this? And of course, reactions depend on worldview. But this is such a big issue that the reaction to this question often shapes a worldview. So there's a two-way process going on. How you approach this question will depend on what color spectacles you're wearing, your worldview, your set of answers to the big questions. But this, above all other issues, can shape and even change people's worldview. And I've met so many people that when tragedy struck them and their family in some way, they have moved from believing in some kind of God to becoming atheists or agnostics. So it's a key question. It's a big worldview question in that sense. And its answer is so important that it may end up shaping your worldview. Now, as James Sire helpfully reminds us in his book, which if you haven't read it, you ought to, The Universe Next Door, the recent edition of it, he points out there are three major families of worldviews. There is the theistic family, and of course, there is the materialistic, naturalistic, atheistic family. And thirdly, there's a pantheistic family, familiar from many Eastern religions and philosophies. And just to take an example from each of those three, the Christian may well respond with Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. There's an explicit reference to earthquakes. Or shall we react like pantheists who say that those who suffer do so because of their sin in a previous life, and their suffering must be allowed to occur because it's helping them work off their karma so that in the next life they will do better. And that will complete their process of purification. And if we helped them, we would be hindering it. It's very obvious, isn't it, that our natural instincts go against that, what I regard as an extremely cruel view of the universe. But many people hold it. Or shall we say, for instance, with earthquakes, that they're a judgment of God, as many people said in New Zealand and in Japan. And then there are others who are either unsure whether there's a God or not, and ask, where is God in all of this? And many of them say, well, he cannot be there. He doesn't exist. And it's a very ancient problem. It goes back to probably beyond Epicurus, but... Let me cite the way it's often cited. (coughs) In the words of David Hume, the Scottish Enlightenment philosopher who's responsible for the atheism of a good number of my colleagues in Oxford and elsewhere. Epicurus' old questions are yet unanswered. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then is he impotent? Is he able but not willing? Then is he malevolent? Is he both able and willing? Whence then this evil? So there's the problem. Now, at this point, many atheists will interject, and if you want me to say something about this, I will in the Q&A. That'll be up to you. And they will point out to people like me, especially me, because I come from Northern Ireland, isn't religion part of the actual problem? Because there's been an immense amount of suffering, pain, and evil caused by religion. That's a very serious question, but I will go by you. I'm going to not talk about everything, because this is a huge topic. So I'm going to indicate things, and if you want me to say more about them, I'm perfectly happy to do so, and that is one of them. 
I would, though, say just prophylactically, so to speak, that any analysis that puts jihadi Islamists in the same category as the Amish is hardly likely to do as much uh, help. But we will come back to that question if you wish. In our world at the moment, our television screens are filled with the horrors of Ukraine, Syria, Iraq, Gaza, various places in Africa, and so on. And we see these often in a very detached way. They're followed by an advertisement for a motor car. And grotesque in its lack of sensitivity. But yet, realism tells us that if you're seeing a doctor next week suspected of cancer, that will weigh on your heart and mind much more than Syria, Iraq, or Ukraine. That is inevitable, ladies and gentlemen. The closer it comes to home, the bigger it is. You might be trying to get close to someone who's suffering from a terminal disease, or to comfort someone who's been raped, or just revealed that she's been a subject of child abuse. And those things will naturally be bigger than what you see at a distance on the news. So that brings us to the next big question about suffering. There's the distant and there's the near. There's the extent of suffering. That is the number who are suffering. And that's usually the distant. And there's the near. My parents, my children, my friends and so on. And we've got to try and get some sort of grip on that. And I want to tell you, I have a lot of sympathy with the many, many people in my life who sat beside me and said, I'm sorry, I lost all my relatives in Auschwitz, and I can't believe in God. I've been to Auschwitz many times, ladies and gentlemen, and I've wept every time. It's not a place you come away from laughing. My heart goes out to people who've had that experience in life. And some of my atheist friends, yes, I would have regarded him as a friend, Christopher Hitchens, who at the age of 22 was asked to identify the body of his mother in Venice who just committed suicide with a defrocked priest. What's a lad like that going to think about God? We need to approach this with sympathy because we're all, at some level or other, damaged and broken people, are we not? And I'll never forget meeting with a, a group of Jews in Austria years ago, but it's happened many times since, and they told me they didn't believe in God, but they didn't want to tell me why. They said, we don't want to damage your faith because we admire it. I said... I respect that, but if my faith cannot meet any objections, it's not worth believing, is it? So in the end, they told me what had happened to them. As Jewish believers in God, they were reading, they read literature to one another at night, and they were reading a Nobel Prize winning book called The Slave by Bashevitz Singer, who won the Nobel Prize for literature. And in the book, Bashevitz Singer describes an occasion where Jewish women and children were buried alive. And I'm not sure whether it was Singer or my friends or both who said, I can forgive God anything, but not that. And they said for us both, the light went out and it stayed out ever since. If you cannot resonate with that, well, you're scarcely human. But I'm sure we all can resonate with that. Because the niggling feeling has come into all our hearts and minds on times. Is there really evidence that could convince us to maintain a faith in God in light of that kind of thing? And if we don't ask it, our friends ask it. So it might be better if we asked it first. Now, let me come to the intellectual side for a moment. And if you don't like logic and argument, I'll wake you up in a few minutes. 
Is the atheistic belief system the only reasonable reaction to the twin problems of evil and pain? Well, I don't think so because there's a massive problem. Atheists talk about the problem of evil. But if there is no God, where do they get the concept of evil? Now, this is a very important question, not only philosophically, but practically. It raises its head famously in Dostoevsky's famous novel, The Brothers Karamazov. The Russians, as you may know, are very clever novelists, and their philosophy is normally communicated to us in the form of novels. It's different from our Western way of writing philosophy. If they want to discuss the problem of evil and suffering, they write a novel about it. And in that novel, there's a very famous statement, if God does not exist, everything is permissible. In other words, there is no morality. Now, you need to just do a logic check here. Dostoevsky was not saying that atheists cannot behave morally. Of course they can. They can put any of us to shame. The Bible records, very honestly, when some even of the pioneers of faith were put to shame by non-believers like Abraham, for instance. Every man and woman from where I sit and you sit is a moral being made in the image of God. And therefore, whether they believe in God or not, they are capable of moral response and moral behavior. Of course they are. And we need to make that very clear, or else we'll never get the dialogue going, either with atheists or of people of other religions. We must show them that we respect their moral judgment because it's from God. And it is part of what we believe at the very basis. But Dostoevsky did not mean that. He meant that if there is no God, there is no rational warrant for having concepts of good and evil. Now, this could lead us into a hugely interesting discussion. I'm only going to go a little way down the path, but it does concern me very much, this whole question, and it's why a few years ago I decided rather crazily to race up and down from Oxford to London for a year and do an additional degree in bioethics to try to understand what is going on here. Let me just formulate part of the situation. And it's this. If you reject God as the source of morality, now God has been the source of morality more or less in the West for a very long time. There's been a transcendent dimension. And the laws of the states, the Western states, have followed roughly parallel to it. And we live in the first generation where that's being challenged because the transcendental dimension, the vertical dimension to God has been lost. Now, logically, still, we need to find a base for morality. And some of the best minds in the world are trying desperately hard to get a concept of rational morality that doesn't depend on God and they're running into enormous difficulty. Let me just illustrate it very simply. If you are a kindly man with a big beard like Charles Darwin, and you observe ants and see them cooperate, you could say, well, there's a rational base for altruism in the animal kingdom. But if you happen to be Darwin's contemporary, Spencer, who saw the struggle and the survival of the fittest, and you apply that in morality, you end up with eugenics in the gas chambers. The trouble is, ladies and gentlemen, once you lose the vertical dimension of God and reduce human beings to the level of other species and then try to create your morality based on a study of animal behavior, you can end up with any morality you like. And that's exactly what's happening. It's exactly what's happening. We could have predicted it. It's a huge question, and it's not simply an intellectual question. It's a practical question, because if you teach kids long enough, 
that they're of no more significance than slime mold, then all kinds of behavior are equally valid. Who are you to say? Because morality then becomes a matter of personal conviction with a slight caveat. That group morality will be determined by who is the most power. Now these are very serious ideas. And they're huge. And you may want to un unpack them a little um, in our q and I'm just flagging them up. I can't begin to um, follow them. But I just want to say this is very important. Now, there is an inevitable logic that if you deny God, and I think Dostoevsky was right, and brilliantly right, that you cannot deduce any kind of rational morality from below human, simply because, of course, morality is a defining property of human beings and not animals. A bee cannot sin. If the noble lion in your wonderful zoo in Sydney bites the head of its zookeeper tomorrow, it will not appear in the court of justice the next day charged with murder. A lion cannot, in that sense, sin. It is not a responsible moral being. Human beings are because they're made in the image of God. And Genesis 2 and 3 defines that morality consisting ultimately in whether you obey the word of God or not. You notice it is God-directed. Now that's crucial for our understanding of it, that the Genesis story, in its first account of creation, tells you that creation is a result of a stepwise series of speech acts, and God said. But the second account of creation, which incidentally doesn't uh, contradict the first, but that's another story, the second account points out that God said something to them. It was his word. In the day you eat, you shall surely die. They had only God's word for it. That is, morality was defined. It actually was not only defined, but was defining their relationship with God. So if you lose the God dimension, looking at it through biblical spectacles, you can see immediately that anything is open. And it's only going to be a matter of opinion and a matter of power. And that, of course, is immensely dangerous because immediately human dignity is lost. Many a Russian intellectual has said to me, we thought we could get rid of God and retain a value for human beings, and we discovered too late we couldn't. So these are very serious issues. And I'll just mention one extra one for those of you who are philosophically inclined. And that is, what is happening is a concerted attempt to solve a problem that David Hume mentioned. And he said he'd noticed people talking and writing, and they would describe a situation, an is, and they'd suddenly move in their discourse to talking in moral terms, an ought. And he said, you cannot get an ought from an is. If you want a bit of fun, you can't sleep tonight. Google the is to ought problem. And you bright folks, have a go at seeing what's wrong with John Searle's solution to it. S-E-A-R-L-E. -E. More seriously, Sam Harris thinks he solved it. And Richard Dawkins for years said that it's very difficult to see how you can get any sense of a morality, particularly an absolute morality without God, but now Sam Harris has solved it in his book, The Moral Landscape. And for that reason, I delayed the publication of my little book, uh, this one, Gunning for God, which deals with this question, um, until I could see what Harris's argument was. And as I suspect in advance, it smuggled in the morality at the front end. But you might want to analyze that, because he's convinced Dawkins now that you can have a serious base for morality without God. Now, those are huge problems, as I say. They are important because they are determining the default position in many of our Western nations. Richard Dawkins has a problem. I use him to illustrate it simply because he's famous. But you'll get it instantly. He is a human being. 
made in the image of God, and therefore he's a moral being. And he doesn't quite know what to do with that because the logic of his philosophical position leads him to this. In a universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt. Other people are going to get lucky and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at the bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. DNA neither knows nor cares. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. Now, the implications of that, and I've put them up against this two or three times in our encounters, if that's what you would call them. That's the end of all morality. There is no good, no evil. But wait a minute. He's the one who writes a book on the God delusion and talks about God of the Old Testament being evil. But where does he get the concept from? When he himself believes that his own theory have dissolved the concept itself. Now, how does he try to get out of that? He does. He says, well, we're products of selfish genes, but we are the only creatures who can rebel against the selfish genes. And many atheists have just laughed and said, how absurd. If we are, as you claim, the product of our selfish genes, then what non-material principle is there that will help us rebel against them? It's his humanity, you see. He finds himself to be a moral being. His philosophy doesn't allow him to be a moral being. So he's caught, but unfortunately, philosophy has become enormously influential. And that's what many young people believe today, that there is no good, there is no evil. They cannot distinguish between right and wrong. And if all possible behaviors are equally valid, as an atheist sociologist pointed out recently in the UK, we're leaving children defenseless. These are such serious issues that we need to, and I would encourage those of you who are younger than me, which is most of you, to, if you can, investigate these things and begin to pop up in public and have the confidence to discuss them. If we are simply dancing to the music of our DNA, then the killing fields of Cambodia, Rwanda, Ukraine, Syria, and everywhere else are just people dancing to their DNA. How can you blame anybody if all their behavior is a deterministic dance to their DNA? Putting it the other way, outrage against moral evil, which classifies many atheists, they get more angry than a lot of their opponents, by the way, which, of course, is as it should be. But that moral outrage is not apropos because their own theories undermine the very concepts of morality that they are using. How can there be an objective standard of good if there is no God? And so the so-called problem of moral evil dissolves into what? The pitiless indifference of uncaring matter. Charles Taylor, who wrote a fascinating book called This Secular Age, agrees, the modern age, more or less repudiating the idea of a divine lawgiver, has nevertheless tried to retain the ideas of moral right and wrong, not noticing that in casting God aside, they have also abolished the conditions of meaningfulness for moral right and wrong as well. Thus, even educated persons sometimes declare that such things as war or abortion or the violation of certain human rights are morally wrong, and they imagine that they've said something true and significant. Educated people do not need to be told, however, that questions such as these have never been answered outside religion. And here's the supreme irony. The morality that Richard Dawkins and Hitchens used to condemn 9-11, for instance, is in the Bible itself. That's where they got it. Dawkins makes this foolish claim that nobody gets their morality from the Bible. And he institutes his new Ten Commandments, which every one of which are from the Bible, as I've analyzed in this book again. Thomas Jefferson 
not a noted Christian, said, God who gave us life gave us liberty, and can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis? A conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God. So if we lose our faith in God, the future's bleak because there's no way we can defend our valued freedoms on the basis of the moral relativism that remains when we've lost our anchor in God. You will notice that no secular morality withstood Stalin, Hitler, and Mao. And no secular morality would be able to withstand secularism or religious fanaticism today. Now, the person that saw this more clearly than anyone else was Friedrich Nietzsche. He saw the consequences of abandoning biblical morality that is at the heart of Western civilization. And he predicted that the death of God would result in a Darwinian imperative expressing the will to power. The strong must eliminate the weak. Listen to this. The biblical prohibition, thou shalt not kill, he wrote, is a piece of naivety. Life itself recognizes no solidarity, no equal rights between the healthy and the degenerate parts of an organism. One must excise the latter or the whole will perish. Nietzsche despised Christian morality as the morality of slaves and pointed out that the death of God would lead to the death of compassion, kindness, and forgiveness. I quote, When one gives up Christian belief, one therefore deprives oneself of the right to Christian morality. Christian morality is a command. Its origin is transcendental. It possesses truth only if God is truth. It stands or falls with the belief in God. Dead right, isn't it? He saw it clearly. And then he asked the question, why morality at all? When life, nature, history are non-moral. He would think, as many do, including me, that contemporary atheists are mostly soft atheists. They want to retain the values of a Western liberal democracy without God. And Nietzsche would say, you can't do it. You just simply can't do it. You're kidding yourself. You see, the fact is there is morality. Even more than that, the fact is that most people have absolute moral convictions. One of them is that torturing infants is wrong. Now, that's a very important thing to observe. A very prominent atheist philosopher at Oxford, J.L. Mackey, who's world famous for his books, he said that ethics constitute so odd a cluster of qualities and relations that they are most unlikely to have risen in the ordinary course of events without an all-powerful God to create them. If then there are such moral values, they make the existence of a God more probable than it would have been without them. Thus we have, after all, a defensible argument from the existence, uh, from morality to the existence of God. Of course, this is what Romans 1 points out, and Romans 2, that our conscience, just like creation is a pointer to God, in its rational intelligibility and its glory and beauty, so our moral conscience is a pointer to the existence of God. And this is simply a confirmation of it from an atheist philosopher. And of course, it's that that gives rise, coming back to where we were before, those of you who have been asleep, please wake up at this point, to the problem of evil. There really only is a problem of evil if you believe in God. But we've been looking a little bit at the so-called atheist solution, and it's very easy to overlook something very important. Atheists think they have a solution. The Dawkins is the extreme. That's just how the universe is. Take it or leave it. That's the solution. But it isn't a solution in any meaningful and comforting sense. He admits that it's bleak. And when I pointed out to him it was bleak, he said that doesn't prove it's wrong. And I said, quite correct, but it doesn't prove it's right either. You'll have to decide that on other grounds completely. Atheism does remove something, though. It removes all hope by definition. 
And so even a superficial analysis can show that atheism can make the problem 10,000 times worse. An atheist who responds to the cancer of his wife or loved one and says there is no God still is left with his wife and loved one with cancer and has no hope now added to that. No rationale, no way to interpret it. It's just how the universe is. It's the old DNA fracturing according to random processes that are blind and do not foresee their consequences in the brain that they've created a tumor in. It removes all hope, and we'll have to come back to that. But now another issue. Why does God allow it anyway? I'm coming back to Epicurus's question. Could he not have created us without the capacity for moral evil? Could he not have foreseen that it would go wrong? And if he's all-powerful, could he not have prevented it simply by creating beings that were incapable of doing evil? Well, of course he could. I mean, after all, we can do that. In most of the world's leading universities, including the University of Sydney, there's a department of robotics where we, much less than God, are creating beings that cannot sin in that sense because they're non-moral beings. They're automata and they're robots. Now, this seems to me to be more important. God could have created beings like that, but they wouldn't have been human beings. They wouldn't have been made in the fullest sense in the image of God because an essential part of being made in the image of God, as we see from Scripture, is that we have been endowed with a unique capacity, not only of rationality, but through speaking with God. We've been given a certain amount of freedom to say yes or no, and it's that certain amount of freedom that creates the possibility of love. And in a universe where it's not possible to hate, there's no possibility of love. That's what we find our minds so difficult to get around. The greatest gift that God has given you and me is that ability to trust, to say yes or no. On the ordinary human level, it was a very meaningful event for me 46 years ago that a certain young lady said yes to me for some reason. I said yes to her for every reason. And that relationship is established. But in a universe of robots, that would be impossible. You would have at best have a, well, I suppose in the contemporary world, you'd have a robotic wife with a mini iPad with instructions on the front here, you know. <laughs> and you'd come home and you'd press menu and you'd get the word kiss coming up and you'd psst, kiss. And you'd get a wonderful electronic kiss that would thrill you to your core. <laughs> you wouldn't, would you? I'm glad you're laughing because we can see the absurdity of it. See, ladies and gentlemen, if you start by saying, I would love to live in a universe where these things weren't possible, well, then you couldn't live in it because you wouldn't be you. You're asking for something that's logically impossible, that you lose all those things that were human. Now, of course, this is going to raise a whole set more problems. I'm aware of that. But let's do it step by step. The ability to love is intimately li linked with the possession of what we call free will. Now, of course, it's not unlimited. I'm not free to run at 60 miles an hour. Indeed, at the moment, I'm not free to run at five miles an hour, but <laughs> that's another matter. But you see, go back to Genesis where it's made so clear. Of all the trees in the garden, you may eat freely. Don't eat of that one. That prohibition is meaningless if they didn't have the capacity to eat of that one. And the relationship with God was to be determined by how they exercised that capacity. Now, even at the much lower level, as human beings, our friendships, what do they arise from? They arise from the fact that someone has chosen freely to trust us, and we've chosen to trust them. That's what friendship consists in. And of course, 
with a little sidelight to the gospel. That's why it's crucial to realize and the gospel of John is full of it. Absolutely full of it from beginning to end. That John is encouraging us to use that trust, that capacity that all of us have on God. We've all got it, of course. A non-believing wife is perfectly capable of trusting her husband, isn't she? And vice versa. And so the challenge is, are we, am I, prepared to use that wonderful gift of God, that capacity to trust, and do it freely and trust God? And I note the New Testament makes it very clear that we're going to be judged for not believing. And that implies, of course, we've got to have the moral capacity to believe. Or else it makes God into a moral monster, which I'm not prepared to believe. So, this business of freedom of will, they're not expressions used in Scripture, but they're reasonable enough because Genesis makes it very clear that the prohibition, they were free to take it. And of course, they did take it and introduce sin into the world. So, robots word of no concept of love. And Jean-Paul Sartre, who is a French atheist existentialist writer, captured this. The man who wants to be loved does not want to possess an automaton. And if we want to humiliate him, we need try to only persuade him that the beloved's passion is the result of a psychological determinism. I don't like it if somebody suggests that my wife loves for me. Love for me is simply psychological determinism. She's dancing to her DNA because it empties it of meaning. Determinism is a very dangerous thing. Many atheists espouse it. But there are others who espouse it as well, because it empties life of meaning. If the beloved is transferred, is transformed into an automaton, the lover finds himself alone. So, of course, standing back from that, it means that God took a risk in creating you and me. Didn't he? Can we understand that? Of course we can. Got any children? Didn't you take a risk in creating them? Didn't you know when you had that child that it might grow up to reject you? Why did you do it then? You see, this sum has been worked out already. I have three children, seven grandchildren. Why did I risk? And I remember holding the first one, little girl, in my hands and thinking, this being has started and is designed to exist eternally. Goodness me, and I have to bring it up. Whew. And it could grow up. She could grow up to say yes to me or no to me. Why risk it? Well, we all know why we risk it. Because the value of a loving child and family far outweighs anything else. It reverberates with the very throbbings of the fundamental meaning of the universe. God allowing us to be children freely, and we have children. So we can understand the risk, can't we? And it's worth reflecting on that. That the sum, as I said, the problem is down on the human level. And there are parents in this room, including me, who've been on their knees weeping about their kids, haven't you? In this world where the pressures are so vast, I scarce know a problem, a family without very serious problems in the upbringing of their children. And we'd love it to be otherwise, wouldn't we? It's good to be honest, you know. It's important to be honest. We're all suffering from la condition humaine. We're human beings. And it's important to see that we take a risk. And it's a little portal in to the fact that God could take a risk. You wouldn't want automatic, autom automata who are children, would you? It degrades a person to reduce them to an automaton, and it can be done very subtly. Well, it's not so subtle when you're an Irishman like me. We get it all the time. Oh, you say that because you're an Irishman. Have you ever heard that? Or you did that because you're a woman. Have you ever heard that, ladies? No? And you know, 
That's a very interesting thing to analyze philosophically because what they're saying to you is we can give an explanation for your behavior, therefore it's meaningless. We can give a cause and effect relationship. It is the beginnings of determinism. And they're cutting you down from being a morally responsible being by saying you say that because you're Irish or because you're a mathematician or because you're whatever it is. They're emptying it of meaning by giving a causal explanation. And that is the heart of deterministic logic, although many people haven't noticed it. So, we don't want our children degraded to automata, and we don't want human freedom to be degraded to an illusion. If we wish for a different world, we may be just wishing ourselves out of existence because there probably will be a world in which love, relationship, and true humanity are logically impossible. And Lewis, of course, makes the point very well that if that is to be the case, the material world must have a certain fixed nature, a degree of autonomy, he calls it. Imagine, he says, if God had created a world so that a beam of wood remained hard and strong when we used it to construct a house but became soft as grass when I used it to hit my neighbor. Or if the air refused to carry lies and insults. Indeed, he says, if this principle were carried to its logical conclusion, evil thoughts would be impossible because the cerebral matter that we used in our thinking would refuse its task when we attempted to frame evil thoughts. All matter in the neighborhood of a wicked man would be liable to undergo unpredictable alterations. He captures it brilliantly, of course. And that would negate, in the end, any sense of freedom and any potential for love. Now, all I've said so far, and I'm going to give you a break in a moment, the free will argument does not apply to natural disasters. You'll see that instantly. And I need to say something about those before we take our break. So let's have a look at earthquakes. Very strangely, before I went to New Zealand, quite by accident, I was reading a fascinating book called Rare Earth by geologist Peter Ward and astronomer David Brownlee, both at the University of Washington. And I was reading, apropos of nothing in particular, the, the chapter entitled The Surprising Importance of Plate Tectonics. And the argument is simply this, if the Earth's tectonic plates ceased to move, mass extinction of life on Earth would eventually ensue. The motion of the Earth's tectonic plates is absolutely essential for you to be alive. That complicates things, doesn't it? That certainly complicates things. Now, there are several reasons. Plate tectonics is essential for the formation of continents, maintenance of the balance between Earth, mountains, and sea. They act as a global thermostat by recycling chemicals crucial to maintaining a uniform balance level of carbon dioxide. The tectonic movement is also responsible for maintaining water liquid. And they argue that plate tectonics maintains the Earth's magnetic field that protects it from cosmic rays that would be fatal for life. Their conclusion is this. It may be that plate tectonics is a central requirement for life on a planet and that it's necessary for keeping a world supplied with water. So on the basis of that, the movement of the Earth's tectonic plates is itself not a disaster. It's essential. The disaster is that people build their houses above fault lines. So here we have a complex situation. On the one hand, here's a process that is essential for the maintenance of physical life, which is destroying physical life. It's not an easy topic, is it? And incidentally, there is a danger of thinking that the earthquake is the outworking of karma or a judgment on people who are worse than others. We might reflect that there were two earthquakes in in Christchurch. One happened in September, about six months before the devastating one, and no one was killed, and there were church services thanking God that no one was killed. Well, had God spared them and changed his mind six months later? That's hardly the case, and the dean of Christchurch, Peter Beck, put it rightly, I think, this earthquake is not an act of God, it is the earth doing what the earth does. But now let me refocus it. 
there's a ring of fire around the world, Alaska right down through the Pacific and so on. It's a large-scale ring of fire. But in my college at Oxford, I have a unique position in the sense I'm the only full professor in Oxford who's also a chaplain, pastoral advisor, they call me at my college. The student phoned me not long ago and told me about her own earthquake. One of her parents had phoned and said the other was seriously ill. And it struck me in retrospect, trying to counsel her, that that news was as significant for her as what happened in Christchurch for those immediately affected by it. Because, of course, the significance of a disaster is measured in terms of its significance for the people involved in it, the individuals involved in it. There's no simple calculus of suffering. Whether we are talking about external earthquakes or internal earthquakes, like brain tumors, cancer, strokes, or coronaries, the effect on the individual and those in their innermost circle is almost identical. And if you'll forgive a personal reference, seven years ago, I was not expected to live for more than a few seconds because they discovered far too late that the major artery out of my heart had closed completely. And they operated and uh, the surgeon said to me at the end, well, Professor Lennox, I don't know what to say to you. You should be dead. But you're not. You've had no damage. You can go home. I put a stent in. You're okay. And people say to me, do you thank God for that? Yes, I do. But at the very same time, my sister, her daughter of 22, just married to a youth pastor, got a fatal brain tumor that took her away within a few months. Do I thank God for that? We can be very simplistic, ladies and gentlemen. We thank God when it goes well with us. But what do we do when it, our nearest and dearest? We have to be able to be measured and sensitive, don't we? It's far more difficult than that. Be careful when you're talking to people to thank God for being cured for some simple illness. They may have terminal illness. Just be careful and be sensitive. You see, the irony is God didn't think my sister's daughter was worse than other people. It's not a moral issue, you see, as our Lord pointed out. Do you think that the people on whom the Tower of Siloam fell were worse than anybody? No! That's Christ's view of it. And so we must be very careful how we judge what happens. And Christ says a very strong thing. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. He didn't, of course, mean that they would all collapse, uh, a tower would collapse on all of them. But he was pointing out that whether large scale or small scale, all these happenings, cancer, earthquakes, they remind us that we are mortal and they raise the question of what our relationship with God is. Because we must all die and after that the judgment. And I'm going to come to that, but after the break, because it's the crucial thing. But let me leave you with a question. I'm sure you've done as I've done most of my life, sat particularly with students and argued what a good God should have done, what an all-powerful God would have done. And we argue and argue, have you ever heard a satisfactory solution to that ring of argument? Have you? No, I haven't. I've done it, still do it. And somehow it's unsatisfactory, isn't it? Because after the argument's gone round and round in circles and we've quantified, qualified, added, subtracted, multiplied, and done all kinds of things were left with a world that presents us with two cathedrals and a mixed picture. We're left with beauty and barbed wire. We're left with mountain grandeur and napalm. We're left with torture chambers and the glory of Andromeda Galaxy. 
when all the argument's done. So getting nowhere with the circular question, what should God have done and would he have done and all the rest of it, I can get anywhere with that. So I have thought of another question, and it's this. Granted that we're facing a mixed picture, granted that, is there any evidence anywhere that there is a God into whose hands we can trust the answer? That's the question. Because the picture is going to be mixed until you die. My wife often says, I'm going to go into eternity with many questions. We all are. Unless we're already brain dead. And so that's the key question. Granted there was a risk. Has God made a big enough provision? In case it appears to go wrong. We can ask endlessly whether God could have made fire that wasn't dangerous. Could have made tectonic plates that didn't cause disasters. And in the end, we're left with this mixed picture. So my question is, is there any evidence and can we communicate it that there is a God who can be trusted with the ultimate answer, with these ragged edges? And of course, the central thing here is the cross because it tells us that God has somehow become part of the problem of suffering and has not remained distant from it. It also tells us that death is not the end. And last year I stood at ground zero in, the, in Manhattan in New York and listened to a long length of reading of names that they have on the anniversary of 9-11. It was very interesting. I did not hear one expression of atheism in the whole three hours, not one. And the interesting thing was that listening to the bereaved read the names of their loved ones on television, it was very moving to hear them address their loved ones who had died as if they were still alive. Daddy, you're my hero. Happy birthday was perhaps the most touching of the ones I heard. A Christian, and there were so many affirmations on that day of Christian faith. It was astonishing. Not a hint of atheism. And constant affirmation of Christian faith. A Christian is not a person who's solved the problems of suffering and pain and evil. But one who's come to love and trust a God who himself has suffered. And those who trust Christ receive a promise that I'm going to refer to because the question has come up about it. That there's going to be a world where suffering will be no more. And there will be no more pain. And there will be no more dying. C.S. Lewis once wrote words that are as opposite today as when he wrote them. A book on suffering which says nothing about heaven is leaving out almost the whole of one side of the account. Scripture and tradition habitually put the joys of heaven into the scale against the suffering of earth. And no solution of the problem of pain which does not do so can be called a Christian one. We are very shy nowadays of even mentioning heaven. We are afraid of the jeer about pie in the sky, but either there is pie in the sky or there isn't. And if there isn't, then Christianity is false, for this doctrine is woven into its whole fabric. If there is, then this truth, like any other, must be faced. The pioneer Christian apostle Paul wrote, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that shall be revealed. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not the words of an armchair philosopher, but a man who'd seen and experienced life at its rough end, beatings, imprisonment, and so on. You see, as we come to the end of this section, 
I want to mention another massive and fatal problem for the atheistic worldview, and that is its ultimate denial of justice. That quote that I made from Richard Dawkins, there's no good, there's no evil, a bit further up the quote, he says there's no justice. Millions of human beings throughout the ages have suffered grievous injustice and after lives of misery have died without any relief. The majority of people living in the world today are in a similar position. All atheism can do is to shrug its shoulders and exclaim, bad luck. In actual fact, you never did have any realistic hope of getting justice. Now, of course, you won't get any because there is no God and death ends everything. But that means, of course, that the terrorists get away from it in the end, with it in the end. A Hitler can shoot himself in the brain when he's finished. That's it. That's an affront to our moral sense, ladies and gentlemen. And the Bible says the exact opposite. It says that God is the authority behind the moral law. And he will be its vindicator as the judge who will come. There will be a final judgment at which perfect justice will be done. Because God will demonstrate that your sense of morality and justice is not a delusion nor an illusion. Many people reject the notion of judgment. They don't like a God like that. But then they protest at moral evil. And they believe in a police force. Which is a very odd thing to believe in. If you don't believe in ultimate justice. And we need to face the fact. That the judgment promised in the Old Testament. Is a glorious thing. A God who didn't judge would not be a God of love. And we need to grasp this. It is so important. In the Old Testament, in poetry, you get people saying, let the hills rejoice and sing and the mountain claps their hands because God is coming to judge the world. It was a glorious concept. When we're angry, we look horrible, most of us. When God is angry, his justice is magnificent. Have you ever noticed that the angels in the book of Revelation that are carrying the judgment of God are magnificently dressed? Not in black, grim and horrible. Because true justice is a magnificent thing. And we need to proclaim our faith in it. It is enormously important. And you know, that changes everything. It's not just the cross, but the resurrection. Jesus, a human, perfect human, yet God is going to be the judge. And he's going to see that justice is done. The whole book of Revelation is about that topic. And sometimes, you know, when I'm pushed on this question, I say, I suspect, that if you could see what God, who loves people more than I do, has done with the innocent who've suffered, you might have no more questions.